in the studio at the Norwegian Defense University College. And we are talking to head of section and super online and blended learner, <laughs> Commander Guy Belgen Isaksen. And from the Norwegian Language Academy, Lingu, we have head of content, Pia Lundsen, and content maker and podcast mentor, Camilla Cahill. And because Camilla and Pia have inspired so many educators to make their own podcasts, we are doing this webinar as a podcast. Um, so we will record the experts conversation um, and then we will open for your questions. But please feel free to use the Q&A during our conversation. Uh, so, Pia and Camilla, I'm a big fan of your podcast, Unmuted. Thank you. And that's also where I heard you talk to Guy the first time. But now I would like to challenge you first. So, what is Flip Classroom to you and why do you want to talk about it? All right, I, I can, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll gladly start. Um, the reason why uh, we have been so fascinated with Flipped Classroom is simply because it's so difficult. And uh, both of us were fortunate enough to um, participate at the um, at the fun uh, yearly conference, which is actually during the pandemic. It was in 2020, and I heard, or we both heard, Guide talk about um, his experiences at the Defence University and, um, or sorry, the Defence University College, um, and how they use flipped classroom. And I was absolutely fascinated. So. With that in mind, when we were preparing for the second season of um, Unmuted, uh, we knew that we, we had to get in touch with you to ask you more about flipped classroom and problem-based learning and blended learning. As Cardi said, uh, now I work as uh, the head of content uh, in, in Lingu, but my background is from, uh, from teaching. I've been teaching around 15 years. Uh, I've tried to implement uh, with my colleagues flipped classroom in, in all of my classes, maybe by calling it something else, but trying to keep it communicative uh, when we're first in class. Um, but it's difficult. I found it to be quite difficult. And it's also now that we're making platform on a full or on a complete digital platform, uh, we try to bring uh, the best things from the flip from flip classroom and problem based learning to the platform mm -hmm. or to digitalize it, uh, but we see that it's uh, we have a lot of uh, there's it's it's difficult to implement it because usually uh, we end up uh, with traditional classrooms. Yes, because there are a lot of expectations <laughs> about learning yeah. that uh, that are attached that make it very complicated sometimes for the teachers to feel safe enough to actually start implementing it on a on a bigger scale basically yeah yeah all right so guy would you like to tell us about your journey from um or in general would you like to tell us about how you started implementing flipped classroom can you can you just give us a little bit of a uh yeah i can try i, I let me start about trying to be an advocate for lifelong learning uh, using myself as an ex example <laughs> uh, I, I started more than 20 years ago uh, as uh, serving on submarines in Norway. And one of the last positions I had was a head instructor for the simulator at the you know, submarine training center. So moving from being an electrician on a submarine to then suddenly starting with learning and educating colleagues, basically. Uh, it's starting, get, get, starting to get more interested in pedagogical aspects and how to train adults, basically. So I moved in from being a naval officer more to, to training and education. Um, and after that, I started working here at the University College in Oslo, moving forward into pedagogical aspects, learning theories, um, and then focusing on uh, online learning and using technology in, in edu education and training. And, and uh, after a while, uh, getting, you know, going from being an engineer, electro engineer, working on learning. Uh, Almost 16 years later, I took a master in ICT and learning. So shifting totally to another uh, subject, I guess, subject area. And working with that, working with my colleagues here at University College, trying to support them in how to facilitate and use 
online learning methods. Um, I got more and more interested in, I guess, the learning theories and pedagogical aspects of learning and getting to more and more be introduced to concepts like flipped classroom, blended learning, uh, problem-based learning, all those things that we have been talking about, uh, talking about for, uh, for a while. And uh, that started to get me more interested and try to explore what that really meant. Um, and in terms of those, if I'm going to briefly talk about those, what those uh, words mean for us, I would say that flipped classroom is, well, if you think about it, maybe not so very new. Because the, um, the, um, the main take for the students to prepare going back in history is that they were supposed to learn and read the syllabus and prepare before they came to the classroom. Homework. Homework. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Popular. I used so to love that. Are we calling it flipped classroom now and it's really homework? Or <laughs> is it a bigger... Well, it's certainly maybe not homework, but it's certainly pre pre preparation. Mm. Um, but the idea, I think, is that some of the experience that we have is that the time for the courses itself are shorter and shorter. We get less mm. time to educate our people. And therefore, we don't necessarily don't have enough time to do the practical parts. Uh, and, and if we are still using the, the majority of the time to do classroom lectures, we get m less time to do the practical exercises. So the flipped classroom in that sense is to replace classroom lectures with something of online resources. It could be an e-learning course, or it could be a video lecture, or it could be something else. But again, the students are using those resources to prepare, mm. be more prepared so when they come to the classroom or the schoolhouse, they can actually free up more time to use the practical exercises, group work, discussions, uh, stuff like that. That is certainly what I could take out from the flip classroom concepts, and th th that's this is the way we try to use it here at the University College. Mm. Yeah, I have to say that uh, I'm also a lifelong learner, and uh, I um, since our since the last time we had our conversation for the podcast. Uh, I now study sound design at the um, at the uh, Christiania University College, and um, there I've they, they've followed the same uh, idea as the University College here, which is that um, everything is problem based. It's all flipped classroom, and it's all blended learning. So, and that means that we can take on board massive amounts of concepts and ideas and information, and then we have to use that information practically to solve problems regarding sound design or sound files or technical, whatever it may be. And I honestly, I honestly believe that it's, it's like, how, how would we otherwise learn all of these things? And it's, it's a really great way of making uh, learning incredibly efficient, but also very quite deep as well, that you get depth learning um, included. So that was just a, a little side comment to what you said. Yeah, and I also <laughs> think in terms of blended learning, again, haven't we done that? for many, many years, because it's diff all about the combination of different learning methods. Mm. So going back again to the, my time on, on, the submarine, from, on the submarine school, classroom lectures, simulator training, practical exercises, we had a combination of different methods that you can argue are blended learning. In terms of blended learning online, it might be something different, but again, it's a combination of maybe e-learning courses, online meetings, video lectures, um, co-writing in a document online, peer-to-peer -peer review. It could be a different combination of methods. Mm. That's certainly what blended learning means for, for me and for us, that it's just a com combination of, of learning methods. Because mm. I guess one important pedagogical principle connected to motivation is a variation of methods, right? So you don't... Definitely. Yeah, you don't, you don't get stuck in the classroom for five weeks just be passive, a passive listener to, to lectures. It has to be a variation there to keep maintain the, the motivation to the students, blended learning. Okay, so just to make sure that we've got everyone on board, yeah? I was thinking that perhaps you'd like to um, just give us a short introduction to flipped classroom, problem-based learning, and blended learning as, and how you use it at the um, Defence University College. Yeah. Uh, Briefly, let's start about the definition, f like we see it, for problem-based learning. Um, 
we think that if we allow our students to work together solving job-related problems connected to the, to the job they're supposed to have when they're graduating, could be the Navy, Army, or Air Force, if they are able to work with problems connected to um, where they are supposed to work, it's more motivating and hopefully gets deeper learning. So connected to the real world. Connected basically. to the real yeah. world. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of, of, of as, as certainly as we see it, problem-based learning. You work with solving problems together with others that are job, uh, job specific to the job you're, you're having when you graduate, after you graduate. And in order to free up more time to work with problems, you add more flipped classroom. So you, you, you replace classroom lectures by giving them the, the, the lectures as online lectures, and then you free up time to work with problems, problem-based learning. And then if you combine that with different methods, you're in the blended learning space. So that's, that's the goal, at least. That's what we try to do, uh, combining those three. Um, and if I'm going to give you an example, um, I think it was in uh, the fall of 2019, uh, we had a, a course in our master's program uh, called Military Leadership. And um, we, uh, we're, I worked closely together with one of the teachers uh, responsible for that course. And we rebuilt the course to try and fit it both to be flipped, problem-based, and blended. So basically, we replaced all the classroom lectures with video lectures. And the students, they got uh, a weekly problem that they were, were working together to solve or, or answer, so to say. Um, and the, the course itself was six weeks, so five weeks with a new problem every week. And at the end of the, the course, they had an oral exam where there were, they, they picked one of the problems they worked with previously and answered that during the, the exam. Um, that was the first, I think, go that we had on trying to combine all those things in one course, flipped classroom, problem-based, blended learning. Um, and we got some very nice experiences. It, it worked quite well. Um, they, they were eager to work with the problems that they found interesting because it was related to, their, to the job, right? And, and, and we think that why it, the reason it was so successful was that all those students, these are master students between 35 and 45 years old, they are experienced uh, officers, worked in the military for a long time, so they, they had a lot of experience with military leadership as leaders themselves and to be, uh, had leaders themselves above them, uh, working with them. So military leadership was an area they had a lot of experience with. So they had a lot of things to bring to the table, so to speak. So when they're working with the problems, it was easy for them to discuss in groups and relate to the problem and come up with answers. So that worked very well. Uh, another take we had is that uh, the oral exam indicated that the students had gotten deeper knowledge mm -hmm. compared to the previous uh, classes. But, I guess one important findings, um, we discovered something called uh, problem-based fatigue, problem-based learning fatigue, that it's, it's more tire tiresome for the students to work with problem-based learning than to just be passive listeners in a lecture in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense, right? Really <laughs> <much. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Um, so. PBL, I guess, should be used with caution. Yeah. And it works best if the students have uh, experience from the field. Uh, if they are unexperienced, you probably will be more difficult and more tiresome for them to, to solve the problems themselves. So uh, it, I guess f for longer courses, maybe several months, you can't have problem-based learning probably all the way through mm -hmm. the course. You have to be cautious, you have to be cautioned and, and maybe combine it with other. It's variation. Variation, mm -hmm. yeah. blended learning. Right. But the topic was already known to them. They were already, they already had some 
experience they, uh, about leadership. They had leaders before them, and they were going to be leaders. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way you flip the classroom was uh, with video-based lectures, mm -hmm. but together with that, a lot of silent uh, knowledge that they had from before, which was the experience. Yeah. So if they came into the course and they didn't know anything about uh, this or the, the topic, uh, using f flipped classrooms, introducing new topics that are completely new. You, do you have any experience with that? Like from scratch to... Yeah, not so much, no, no. no. Okay. So we have tried to apply, apply problem-based learning to our students that have some experience. Yeah. So I don't think that uh, in our bachelor programs, uh, the students are 19 years old, 20 mm. years old, coming directly from, from I guess, what is it, vocational college? What is it we call it in Norway? Uh, so they, they don't have a lot of experience. Mm. So, so PBL may be not so useful for them, at least more challenging, because they don't have any experience in the many, many of the fields that we are teaching them. Mm. So we have the areas that we have tested so far are with students that have a certain amount of experience in the field. Right, it's all very interesting that you're talking about the perspective from the students, which is very valuable, but how about the teachers? Do they feel slightly cautious about being in front of a video? Well, I think that's very <laughs> individual. Um, I mean, is it, has it been easy to um, onboard the teachers into this method? Is it? Is it? Well, yes and no. Um, I think some, some teachers have been more than willing to try it out uh, here in, uh, in this studio uh, right here. Um, and for the most of us, it's, uh, it requires some training yeah. and to be used to be filmed, right? And like, like we feel right now. Yeah. We're filming <laughs> the studio. Right? Um, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we give them the opportunity to come here in the studio and, and try it out, basically, to train uh, with the support of, of Gustav, who works in the studio here. Um, and our experience is that if you allow them to try it out, they are more willing to, to use video lectures uh, going forward mm -hmm. because they see the benefits from it. What are the so, benefits? Sorry. sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. Uh, what would you say are the, are the benefits for the teachers? Well, normally a classroom lecture, traditionally, what is it, 45 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Um, when we challenge them to really be specific about what they're supposed to cover in the lecture, it tends to be down to 20 minutes because they are quite specific and to the point of what they're talking about. And the students, we got feedback from the students of this. It's that, of course, if you, if you're supposed to, the things you're supposed to tell us, if it takes 20 minutes, don't use 45 minutes. If you can be specific, that's great. So that means basically that they, you, you don't go around recording classroom lectures. We don't, we, we did some of that in the early, early beginning, yeah. because some of the teachers said, well, I don't have time. Uh, Just come and record me call, class. Come and record me. <laughs> we did, or Gustav did, and, but when they saw the results, I mean, you, you have seen recordings from the classroom, people standing up, uh, coughing, <laughs> uh, telephone ringing. <laughs> Exhausting to watch. Yeah, and, yeah. and the, the screen is uh, far away from the camera. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to see what's there. Sound is awful. Sound is awful. And you're observing interaction that you can't, yeah. you can't really take a part of that interaction. Exactly. So you're, yeah. Yeah, and, and when, the, the, when the teachers saw that, they were, okay, then let's try the studio, mm -hmm. see what that takes. And then, it's funny, Coming in the studio, it was a, yeah, I'll just talk and you record me. And I think the longest recording we had in the studio was three hours. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Gustav. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. And, and, then, and then when the teacher saw that, they said, well, well maybe that's too long. Let's yeah. try it again. So by facilitating and supporting yeah. them coming to the studio and try it out, they get a better understanding of how the optimal, optimal video lecture could be. And they get advice from, from Gustavo and, and other people at the college on how to best implement both pedagogical but also motivational strategies in the videos. Okay, so you've talked a little bit about the, the length of uh, the ideal length of a video, mm. but could you just talk a little bit about the best practices regarding format, length and amount of digital teaching when it comes to using flipped classroom? Um, yeah, I can try to do that as well. I think in terms of length, mm -hmm. Mm, I think that some of the literature out there in the projects have defined that shorter the better the videos, right? 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I think that's still valid, 
But we had a project in our bachelor program. I think that was early, uh, the spring 2020. The pandemic just hit. And one of the courses had to replace all the classroom lectures with video. Video lectures, pre-recorded, or live lectures in Teams. Mm -hmm. And some of the pre-recorded videos were more than 20 minutes. It was 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes, maybe over an hour. And during our survey or the evaluation of the course afterwards, we found that some of the best liked videos were longer than 20 minutes, maybe mm -hmm. 45 and 50. And that was linked to the engagement of the teacher. Mm -hmm. So that indicates, again, that if the teacher itself are able to be engaging in his videos, maintaining their attention, if he applies pedagogical and motivational strategies, it doesn't matter if the videos are 45 minutes. They well, still like it. That's great news. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I think that it's a good thumb rule that if you can keep it short, yeah. keep it 20 minutes. But if you have to have a 40 minute long video, that's okay too if you are able to be engaging and use the right strategies, right? Don't use text heavy PowerPoints yeah. and talk a lot because then you'll lose the listeners. Um, so that's in terms of length, that's certainly our experiences. Um, the best practice for flipped classroom, um, again, it depends on your, on your need. If your need is to free up a lot of time, then you can basically replace all the classroom lectures, can't you? Because a good classroom lectures can also be a very good video lectures. Uh, and then the students can prepare, they can watch the video or the lectures several times, right? They can repeat. Uh, and it can be reused from year to year as well, right? So you can use it the next year. Mm. Um, so there's no really set of number of, of lectures that can be replaced. It, it, um, I think that use it as much as uh, you can, basically, mm. because then you free up more time to practical exercises and, and more discussions and, and the students can work together. But regarding format, is video, is, is it is important that it's purely video or... Is it, our pod, would you consider ever using podcasts or? Yeah, I think that we have also had, uh, we also have recorded podcasts in the studio, uh, conversations with teachers or experts. And that's also very useful. Um, I listen to podcasts myself. Um, Arbor's Torn uh, is a podcast here in Norway. That's just is a general podcast. Uh, your podcast, Unmuta. Uh, list, listening to these types of podcasts gives you a lot of information and makes you reflect around certain topics and thus you're learning, right? So absolutely, podcasts are useful as a resource itself. It doesn't have to be locked into video. And also it's much more flexible. You can actually listen whilst you're, um, whilst you're doing other things, even though you shouldn't be doing other things, but yeah. sometimes you go for a walk or you, you know, you're on the bus or it's not possible to actually w watch, watch the video at the same time and people learn in different ways and mm. it's, you know, you can suit it to, to cater the needs of every individual learner perhaps, I don't know as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a lot of re research indicates that there's no need to actually see the people, the person talking in a video. You see the, the, the graphics or the, and you hear the, the, the voice itself. And then, then you're close to a podcast, aren't you? So, yeah, useful. You talked about uh, the videos or the, the, the flipped part. But when it comes to assessment, do you have any best practices when it comes to assessment of uh, if, uh, the or if the students uh, saw the video or listened to the podcast? Mm -hmm. Is that something that happens in the classroom? Or is that something that happens by the oral exam that you mentioned? Um, how can you know that the flipped part works? Uh, is that yeah. something that happens in the classroom when you meet uh, them good, probably? Good, good, good uh, question. Um, we, we've used bo both of the evaluation processes we ask the students, mm. we look at the results from the exam, but we also uh, use the technology. Mm. The data we get from our learning management system uh, and the programs that we use um, publishing the videos. So by, by using those data, we can actually see which of the students watched which video. Yeah, 10 long, seconds in, 10 they seconds stopped. In, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Did they watch the whole video, mm. half of the video? Uh, so we got a lot of data uh, there as well. And that's why we could see that some of the 45-minute videos were actually watched the whole time, mm. not only half of them. People didn't drop out. And 
on the other side, we can see that videos, the students dropped out after four minutes. Mm. That's yeah. useful data. Yeah, because yeah, I'm thinking also that don't a lot of teachers feel a, quite a lot of trepidation about um, about n being secure of the fact that their students have watched the videos and that their students are prepared, so they're not going into a classroom and having to reteach or some, yeah, have to, having to teach um, the information or pass on the information that 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 was kind of expected that the students were supposed to. Learn. It's a bit of a an evil circle. It's, it is. It's, it it's, is. It's, it's quite. I mean, there's, you as a, as a as a teacher, you have to be quite sure of what you're doing, and you have to have the faith that your students will watch the videos. I there's mean, certainly an amount of trust there, right? Yeah. Because um, yeah, we have a quite funny example, I think. But one of the courses we had, um, this the videos wasn't wasn't really watched much. And we asked the students, why, didn't, why don't you watch the videos you're supposed to prepare for the class? And they say, well, we, this does, it makes no sense watching the videos because our teacher will repeat it anyway in the classroom. Okay, so then we asked the teacher, why do you repeat all the videos in your classroom? And he said, I have to do it because the students don't, don't watch the videos. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we have a catch-22 yeah. kind of thing going on. And so certainly to make flip classroom work, there has to be some trust there. The teacher has say, I produce these videos. I'm not going to cover that in my lectures. I'll, I'm, go, I'm moving forward. I'm making discussions. I, I'm working with problems. It's up to the students to actually watch the videos. That's the, the contract between the student and the, yeah. the teacher, I think. I think coming from, from language, uh, or we come from different different backgrounds, but we have a lot of courses that are six, uh, six weeks or three months or very short courses. Uh, the group is usually uh, 14, 15, 16 students, and there's uh, I, we already all of us know this from before. But there's always like two or three people who who prepare, uh, and then the rest makes that the situation you just talked about happens. That the, the, okay, so they didn't prepare. Well, I need everyone to come with me or to learn what we were supposed to learn. So I will go through the uh, the things again. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, I, from my lingu experience or from my language teacher experience, that has led me to, like, I, I just do it sometimes, but then I very often, or me and my colleagues, we very often end up teaching the same things that was in the video. So the flip part becomes just an extra. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes like, oh, it was fun, like, getting the, the, the new information about Norwegian grammar uh, in a different perspective, from a different perspective, but we're going to go through it in class as well. So. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, do you have any stories about when it like it worked hundred percent like you flipped the classroom and then you didn't have to teach this the, the things yeah, again I think, I think the <laughs> if you understand my question yeah. Yeah. everyone's like <laughs> Because we're talking about adults here yeah. and but we're like okay adults they they prepare and so on but yeah talking well, about we paradise. try. Yeah, <laughs> big, big things to do. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the best example, but of course we got uh, the help from the pandemic, if you can say yeah. that. Because you had to. You yeah, had to, right? Had to. Yeah. Uh, that was the project I mentioned earlier, where all the lectures in the classroom were mm -hmm. replaced by online lectures. Um, the result, the grades were actually better. Mm. Uh, because, again, they were forced to using the online resources. Um, so we do, I don't we don't really have an example of the ideal course yet, but the best example we have and, and it's quite motivational I think because even though they were forced to use the online resources and working together the grades were better so the learning was at Deep. least good enough. Yeah, I have to say from from uh, my study at the sound design, the problem based learning actually sort of it kind of covers that area. Uh, in the sense that um, if you haven't prepared, if you haven't watched the videos, you're going to experience in your group when you're collaborating and you're solving problems, yeah, that you are the one that's behind. And so there's a, like a, there's a social dimension to it that's quite not awkward, but it's it's just present. Peer pressure. So you kind of feel that you know you know after the first time you've solved a problem or the first session, yeah. All right, okay. I need to prepare. I need uh -huh. to do that. So it's it's actually quite intuitive, but that's purely based on, on my experience, which has made me completely convinced that flipped classroom and problem based learning is a really good way of learning. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that was uh, just as a slight comment. Yeah, and the, uh, 
adult learners are supposed to be responsible for their own learning, right? <laughs> so we expect them to be prepared and certainly maybe less for the younger ones, but it's certainly adult learners should be. They have enlisted and applied for these courses voluntarily, so they should be motivated, hopefully. Well, could I ask a question to all of your experts? If they don't prepare, they come to school, they do the tasks or assignments, and then they realize what they don't know, and then they go home and watch the videos, listen to the podcasts. Wouldn't that also probably result in good learning? Oh yes, definitely. Well, yeah. pardon me, I'm just answering for myself, yeah. but yeah, I uh, I definitely say that that is it's a it's very motivational. Mm -hmm. It's learning where you're actually looking for the answers that you didn't have previously, and you're trying to find thing out, things out. So yeah, it's it's like uh, if you have to take a online test fifteen times. <laughs> have, haven't you learned? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've gone back and done it and done it and yeah. done it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so if uh, Gerd, could you be so kind as to tell us a little bit about what kind of lessons the college has taken away from using problem based learning as an integral part of the learning process? Yeah, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well, but, but certainly to be cautioned about the amount of problem-based learning. Yeah. So for the longer courses, make sure that you don't only use problem-based learning, but also have variation and blend the learning with something else as well. Uh, but we found in the project that we have tried it to implement problem-based learning that the, the learner seems to be deeper. The, the students get more tired, but they have a deeper understanding of the subject. And they are, they seems to be better uh, capable of discussing the subject uh, more deeply. They can apply more critical thinking to the subject as well because they have deeper knowledge of it. Because they have discussed it to length with their fellow students in groups. So, so, so that's why they have acquired more knowledge and been able to reflect more about it. Um, that's certainly our, our experience. Are we doing it enough? I don't think so. I think that a lot of the courses that we have here at University College have a potential of implementing that uh, to greater length. And then again, we have our students are from 19 years old up to 55, 60 years old. So you have to you have to do an analysis for you before you start your course, right? Who's my group of students? How old are they? What's their experience? What's their background? And then of course trying to apply the, the best learning method. And in many cases, I think that problem-based learning could be one of them. Um, and certainly, if there are areas where the students have previous knowledge and experience, that uh, could be quite useful. And I also think it's more motivating to be working with problem that you recognize that as valuable real. and real, mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. But you talked about uh, student fatigue or problem, prob PBL fatigue from the student perspective. Mm -hmm. And also we talked a little bit about the, uh, it's, it's difficult for a new teacher to just like stand in front of the, a video and then produce in that way. But it also requires a lot from the teacher of uh, uh, talking, or what I, what I mean by that is it requires a lot from the teacher um, in context of what happens in the classroom. They have to plan different activities. You can't just like open the door and okay, discuss today's problem and then leave. So it, it requires a lot of effort from, from the teacher as well. Do you have any, how are your teachers, uh, if we don't only talk about the producing of the, of the videos and the podcast, but about what happens in the podcast, no, in the, sorry, in the classroom mm -hmm. and the follow up mm -hmm. of what the students produce? Yeah, so I think again, we, we are moving forward to maybe changing the role of the teacher a little bit. Mm -hmm because it used to be the provider of learning, mm -hmm. lecturing in the classroom, uh, performing the subject in the classroom, because they are the experts. Maybe more and more they are moving forward to be something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, in the future, will be facilitators of learning um, situations or learning uh, activities. So this, they, they, they record their lectures, they let the students prepare at home or wherever they are, and when they come to the, to the learning activities, they only facilitate the learning process more than being the provider of the answers. Mm. The guides on the side. The guides on the side. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, and I think that gets some time to get used to yeah. for many of the learners. Mm. Because if, if I'm not supposed to be in a classroom giving lectures, what am I supposed to do then? I would argue that you are equally, maybe more important, 
as the facilitator of the learning process than necessarily being the one giving all the answers mm. in the classroom. My experience is that, I don't know about you guys, but my experience is that the students themselves can actually find the answers to the problems and the questions that you ask if you give them the opportunity and the time to do it. Um, so I think that we have a way to go there. We can apply it more. Yeah. Okay, so, Gail, I have a question for you, mm -hmm. which is basically, what is cognitive overload and how can we avoid it when using problem-based learning, flipped classroom and blended learning? Well, in the worst case scenario, the, the, the viewers have it right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's scary to think about. Right? Well, cognitive overload, I th in terms of what, what it means, is that uh, unfortunately our brain has a limit when it comes to processing information. So our working memory uh, has a limit. So if we, if we are um, getting too much information at the same time, we are not able to process everything. And some of the information will get lost. The, uh, inf uh, the example I, I usually uh, tell about when I talk about quantity overload is when I watch football at home on television, <laughs> on television and my wife or somebody else trying to talk to me, oh. giving me a, a message or telling me something. I have, to t I have to decide, right? Football or my wife or somebody else. And if I, I have to choose because if I'm watching something, it's hard to process the other other, th other thing, right? So pictures and, and voiceovers and sound from the TV, and then somebody else has talked to you. Information will get lost. F football or all the message, right? And then you choose. Yeah. I the choose football. the football. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, the, that's the argument. Yeah. So, and that's the same thing, giving a lecture in the classroom. If you have a text heavy based, uh, heavy text based PowerPoint lecture, yeah, in the back. In and the back, on the screen. Whilst you're talking. Whilst you're talking. You, you're basically giving your students a choice. Read or listen to what I'm saying. Mm. And basically, some of the information will be lost. And if you have ever watched students in the classroom, if they're yearning a lot, getting tired, it means that the brain are working overtime. So that could be a sign that they are, it's overloading. It's too much information. Uh, anyway, I'm getting tired. And then again, to try to avoid cognitive overload. I mean, it's equally important in the classroom, but it's also important online because the students are left by themselves, right, to watch yeah. the, uh, the videos or, or the e-learning courses. So to try to avoid that, it's some, some of the pedagogical and motivational principles you have to apply on your, on your lectures. Don't use a lot of text. That that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, goes without saying mm. in these days. And try to have variation in your presentation, because then you are maybe able to maintain the attention of the, of the, the viewer or the learner. And, um, well, tell, in the beginning of the lecture, tell the students why this is relevant. Yeah. Why is this important for you in your job later? Because then you, again, bigger chance that they will maintain their attention during the lecture. Yeah, it's refreshing their motivation a little bit. Yeah, a little yeah. bit during the time. And then variation of the types of graphics you use. Mm. Um, maybe ask questions in the middle of the videos. But cognitive overload, the way you're describing it now, it sounds like that, that could just as well be something that happens in, a, in, the, in the classroom. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, but at least when you're working with a video, you, you can tailor your presentation to avoid those kind of mistakes. Whereas in the classroom, you've got yeah. your blackboard or you've got something going on and you're talking at the same time so it's yeah it's a problem that and still today just last week in a conference here in Oslo people giving a talk had a lot of texts on their PowerPoint slide and they were saying the exact same thing mm. yeah why yeah because then you force a read or I listen to you so, so the, the best combination in terms of, of uh, avoiding the overload is just have some graphics that supports what you're saying, instead of just having a lot of text and, and talk at the same time. Mm. So that's that's why we're trying, uh, through the use of the studio as well, giving the, the teachers advice on how to tailor and best uh, have a, prepare their PowerPoint slides, uh, so they can then use it as a support to what they're saying. Mm.
because that's exactly what it is. And then when you make a video, you're, you actually have the power to be the puppet master and then you, can, you will have the opportunity to tell the students what's in it for them, what's in it for you. This is the reason why it, it sh it's probably important for you to watch this video and then you, uh, and then having that in, your, in the back of your head when you make the video is, uh, is important. And then it also becomes a constant tweaking process, doesn't it? Because then you can improve and you can improve and you yeah. can improve. And so you're constantly refining your content. Yeah. And yeah, I remember. So, sorry. No. But I remember in the beginning when we made videos at Lingu for four or five years ago. And some of the videos are just like text, text and voiceover. And we were like, OK, this is probably a good video. And then looking at it now, uh, with everything we've learned, and also from you, uh, our videos are different. <laughs> yeah, now, if I can give an example of the, I guess, the power of animations and graphics. Yeah. Um, we made a uh, e-learning course for a new uh, personnel serving on submarines some years back. I used to be a teacher at the submarine school, and if I will uh, teach them about the, let's say, the proportional system of the submarine, you will use 90 minutes to explain it. But by developing a tailored video, an animation, that could be reduced to a video for 45 seconds to explain mm -hmm. the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So by, by really utilizing the, the possibilities of the technology, animations, graphics, online learning, the learning can be more effective. Mm -hmm. You can see it more time after time and repeat it. And it, it's easy to explain uh, advanced things, I guess. Uh, machines, systems, concepts. Mm. Um, so, so if you are able to, able to utilize the technology in the best possible way, it makes the lear learning more effective as well. Mm. OK, so what are the three most important lessons identified after having used these three methods for a prolonged period of time? Well, uh, I think we covered it a little bit, but uh, problem-based learning, uh, used with caution. Uh, can be uh, problem-based learning fatigue. Um, it's best, you, uh, most use, useful, we think, uh, if you have experienced students. So if they are very, uh, if they are very experienced in the subject matter, problem-based learning, uh, problem-based learning are more more uh, more useful. Flip classroom. Um, our experience is that most of the lectures can be replaced. Uh, classroom lectures can be replaced by uh, online lectures or podcasts or e-learning courses. And therefore, you can use your new role as a facilitator of learning activities to, to let the students work in groups solving problems, um, practice some of the skills they're supposed to learn, um, ask questions to the experts when they meet them instead of listening to them, mm. and challenging them, discussing with them. Um, and to maintain variation and motivation in all of your teaching, not only on the video lectures, uh, apply pedagogical and motivational aspects. Um, in many of the e-learning courses that we have developed for the last five or six years, we have always started with a video mm. explaining the reason why they're supposed to learn this. What is, what's in it for you? Why is it relevant for you? What is, wh how is the relevance against your job? Um, hoping that they will keep the attention for the, for the duration of the e-learning course, right? One example of that is that we had an e-learning course in uh, color coding and symbols of ammunition. Mm -hmm. Boring stuff. Yeah. The learning, learning it is sounds, right. Sounds yeah. exciting. <laughs> yeah. Because you have to memorize all these codes and all the colors, and it could be boring, right? But the reason, because you should learn this, it's, it's very, very important, because if you bring live ammo to an exercise in the woods, mm -hmm. ultimately you could end up hurting somebody or killing somebody. And we had an example uh, telling them of a situation five or six years ago that almost that always happened. Hoping that that example will give them more understanding of why it's important to learn this and the motivation to, to do the course right away. So that's certainly one of the uh, one motiva uh, motivational tactic we use to, to point out the relevance of the course. Mm. I think that's uh, at least three takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so how is the use of flipped classroom approach relevant in today's situation? Uh, good question. Um, I think 
unfortunately, it's been even more relevant in the, in the times since, I mean, the attack on Ukraine sh was in February last year, 24th February. And uh, Norwegian Defense University College has cooperated with the, our Ukrainian college for, for many years now. Uh, our sister, uni sister university in Kiev, the National Defense University of Ukraine, named after Ivan Chernokovsky, is a longtime partner for us. Um, and mo like most of us have seen on the news, uh, they have a hor horrific, uh, horrific situation right now. Uh, some of those schools are not longer useful. Uh, the university in Kharkiv was bombed in the spring, uh, so the students could no longer be safe and used the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. So they had totally had to shift over to online teaching. All the students worked from home, the teachers worked from home, but they were able to maintain the education and keep learning because they had online lectures and videos. And that made us, at least in the Defense Forces, uh, think a lot. Do we have a resilient system? If we get another pandemic, or God forbid, do we get a crisis or, or war situation in Norway, are we prepared to keep doing our, our courses, supporting our, our students with the educational system that they need? The, the experiences from the Ukraine uh, shows us that the, the capability of keep, be able to keep educating people are more important than ever. They have a bigger need now even to educate mm. soldiers and officers because of the war, because the people are, have to be replaced. They have to have more soldiers, more officers. And then if you think about, we talked about flipped classroom. So basically that is to have digital versions of your lectures. We could do that with all our lectures, having them in backup, as a stored in the system, be prepared for a situation that might happen might be another pandemic, might be that the schoolhouse are not longer safe, and not longer uh, accessible, but making sure that you have electronic or, or digital versions of your lectures makes you more prepared for those kinds of situations. And it adds a very flexible dimension to your learning process as well, because you're no longer bound to places or um, objects in order to, of course, you need internet, but apart mm -hmm. from that, you're, you're, you can continue your learning process. Yeah, and that's also one of the things that we have seen from Ukraine, that even though the, the schoolhouses are no longer safe, they can't really meet physically, they still have access to the internet. Uh, and so they can ac access the, the online lectures or they can watch videos mm -hmm. uh, and YouTube and stuff like that. So, yeah, it certainly makes sense to be more prepared. And that might be a motivation for the teachers, or maybe we can task them to be more prepared. Do we need a resilient system mm. to be to be prepared for any kind of mm. situation in the future? Okay, so we're rounding off now. I've got the last question for you, yeah. which is how and when do you evaluate the effectiveness of the methods? Well, the the, the biggest method I think that we are we, we do we do surveys uh, with the students. So we ask them again. What do they think about the courses and try to, to get them to evaluate the different learning methods that we have and, and see the effectiveness of it. Uh, and then we try to combine courses from year to year and see if they change the outcome, mm. the grades basically, mostly. I have to say, I'm sorry to say that we don't have the time to actually go back to the students a year after, mm. or two years after, to see how it influenced their job. The relevance. <laughs> That's pretty difficult. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> difficult task. I mean, we do relevant surveys, relevant surveys, um, because it's very important to see if the, the courses that we deliver fits the job des the description for the students. Uh, but that's not really connected to the online or the learning methods itself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more of the, the, the total outcome of the, the program. But we, we're trying to just ask them be very specifically uh, you have in this course you have access to these ten videos uh, in terms of length, motivation, variation. What do you think about this video? How do you think this video is linked to the learning outcome? Because you knew the learning outcome. How do you find the link between the videos and the, the learning outcome? 
how do you think the videos were able to support you in your learning process? How often do you do these assessments? After every course or in the, in the middle of the course? I think that also varies a lot. Yeah. And some of the research projects that we had when we used the courses that we have certainly asked these questions more. Mm. Uh, I don't think that every course uh, are asking these questions in length. Uh, so it's, it depends a little bit of mm. the time of the teacher and the, and the willingness of the teacher as well. Yeah. But that's, that's basically the go-to method. We ask the students to look at the, uh, the grades and we're trying to in detail get the information of what's working or not working. Mm. And like I said, also trying to do the relevant surveys and see if they're supposed to learn about joint military operations, you can ask the people they work with or their bosses, do they know eno enough about joint military operations mm. after c graduating from our, our, uh, our university? Mm. Mm. Yes, good. If not, maybe we have to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you Pardon? very much. This, yes. Oh, this has been so great. I've learned so much. So I've learned um, that in order to be successful with problem-based learning and flipped classroom, so you explain to the students why you do it, what's in it for them, and they will experience they had to work harder, but they will also learn better. And you say that you can have all sorts of content, all formats, but videos, actually one success factor for videos is to have an engaged teacher on the videos and not too much text. And uh, the content, uh, when, when you have adult professional learners, the content need to be relevant to their experience and their job. And I have so many questions, but I'm not going to hog the time. So <laughs> we will take five minutes break, five minutes comfort break, and uh, keep feeding the Q&A with your questions. And we will start, we will not. The experts will start answering the questions when we get back.